Welcome back, everyone, to a very special episode of the I Didn't Read Your Book podcast. You may notice this looks a little bit different. Don't worry, the uh, the uh, interview will be exactly as you expect it. But uh, we are doing something special today. We are not speaking with an author. We are speaking with another YouTube uh, content creator. So this is going to be the one. This is going to be the episode that separates the men from the boys. This is going to be the one that lets me know who's who's really a fan and who's just a poser. You know, you guys have been riding with me 28 episodes, five or six uh, different lives, and uh, you know, going all over uh, uh, all over the internet, talking to different people. I'm hoping that by now, I I got a little bit of trust that I can call on. I know Jesse somewhat. Well, not like know him personally too well, although I did go to a UFC event with him in Vegas, which was awesome. Um, but I'm very familiar with Jesse. Usually, you know, we're coming into these episodes and I have no idea who the person is. Oftentimes, I don't know what they even look like or how to pronounce their name until they're on the screen. But today, I wanted to make an exception because I want to introduce you guys to this this uh, this person. Um, it's very likely that, uh, uh, you know, he, uh, it's very likely that, you know, he, uh, has your attention before mine. And a lot of you may be here specifically for him and, uh, don't really care about who I am. If that is the case, um, awesome. Please just remember to, uh, to, uh, subscribe. And, um, before we get into the interview, for those of you who are not familiar with Jesse, I want to uh, take uh, take you through a, a video of his and um, just kind of give you a little bit of context. So he his channel is Jesse on Fire. Definitely, definitely go subscribe. He also has Jesse on Everything, uh, which is more um, p uh, politics and culture and stuff. Um, I wanted to stay away from that in the intro just because I think we're going to get into that stuff in the, uh, the conversation, in the interview. So... Um, and I had planned on going through his library and finding something that exemplified why he is not only uh, uh, somebody that, uh, uh, you know, not only his passion for the sport, but also his ability to see what's going on and to uh, tie the dots together. So uh, uh, if you're if you have no idea what I'm talking about and you're not an MMA fan, you may not be aware of the fact that. Uh, MMA, UFC, is a lot more than just the punches and kicks and uh, what happens between, um, you know, uh, uh, the start of the round and the end of the round or the start of the fight and the end of the fight. There's a lot that goes on in between fights, in between cards. And and uh, because it's an individual sport, us fans get really closely connected, personally connected to these fighters. And so the things that are going on in their lives, all this kind of stuff is important to us. Now you could get, there's plenty of fighter interviews and, uh, uh, you know, fighters have their own YouTube channels and stuff like that. There's plenty of that content out there, but what Jesse offers is something a little bit different. So going into this, if you're not an MMA fan, I just want you to place the way that he's talking about what he's talking about into the context of really any, uh, hobby or industry. Um, it, that's the particulars of who this person is and that person is, that's not really the point of why I'm showing you this video. Um, you know, without a, uh, a, a cover of a book to read or, or without a cover of a book to look at or the back of the book to read, um, this is, uh, this is what we're going to get to just introduce you to, uh, Jesse. So it's a little bit of a, a, a long video. I sped it up a little bit. Uh, we're going to go through it. I'm not going to waste time, um, you know, teaching you the the history of every person that he talks about. It's just meant to give you a, a snapshot into what he does so that uh, you have an idea of what we're doing when we uh, jump into the interview. So without further ado, let's dive right in and watch some Jesse on Fire. Um, in this video, he is um, he's talking about 
uh, Chael Sonnen. So that's one person I will talk about. He talks about as well. Uh, Chael Sonnen is a former fighter, retired, who has taken to YouTube and has really made a name for himself um, in the similar space as Jesse. Um, kind of doing it on a a, a larger uh, degree, obviously. You know, having the the um, the audience from being a UFC fighter, uh, but he is uh, sometimes. You know, not always, uh, um, I guess the right way to say it is, as Jesse points out, is that this man, is, Chael, is somebody who works for the UFC. And when I say works for the UFC, I don't necessarily mean he puts out a video and the UFC is paying for, uh, you know, the editor and this, that, and the other. But he wants to push the narrative that the UFC as a company wants the viewers and the fans to understand. And when there's, uh, you know, when there's real people and there's real money at stake, then, you know, what the company wants and what the fighters want and what the fans want don't always mean the same thing. So that's kind of just a little bit of what we're going into. Um, and uh, uh, I, I just think that uh, we'll. Uh, so, so, yeah, let's dive in. And if there's anything that how do I change this? Uh, if there's anything that I need to stop and talk about, then we'll stop and talk about. So without further ado. Jesse on fire. Start with Chael Sonnen. So we're going to talk about Chael Sonnen's channel and general um, assumptions that you can, okay? So if you watch closely, Chael is a person who is always going to make pretty clear where he sits on a topic. And his opinion, in almost every case, aligns with the interests of the UFC. That's not a bad thing. He's on their team, okay? Now, if you're a team player, as Chael is, as I am, you are generally going to have opinions that align with the interests of your team, right? But you have to keep that in mind when you watch his videos sometimes. Like, you know, the, and let me just say this before I even get into this. The only reason I have this channel is because Chill put me on fans, fan questions twice. He put me on fan questions twice. And I started, you know, sending them in all the time. I was like, God damn, I'm good looking at these videos. It's not pretty fucking smart too. Why can't I just do this myself? And that was one of a few reasons why I started the channel, a big one. And so I will always be eternally grateful to Chell, not to mention, you know, I basically modeled my entire thing after how he does it, low editing, et cetera. Bottom line, Chell's done. When I watch his stuff though, I don't just watch it and just kind of go, okay, like, let me mindlessly listen to this. I watch it, I listen to him, and then I think to myself, what's the what's the core message that he's trying to send, and what is that, how does that align with things that I know that are going on in the UFC right now? Because he he will tip the hand of the UFC if you're listening. Like, you know, I mean, you kind of have to have some form of base understanding of the business itself and, the, you know, the, the way that these things work. But if you do, and you listen to his channel, a lot of times you can pick up a lot of stuff that he might not be directly saying. And today is one of those things because he tipped his hand. I think, I'm going to say, I'm very confident, like very confident. And only, and only this confident after kind of validating my point with someone who would be more in the know with, more in the know than I would. But uh, but yeah, so I'm gonna share with you what that is because it has to do with Nate Diaz and it has to do with Jake Paul. So like, if I was gonna give an example of, of Chael kind of voicing an opinion that was very obviously kind of uh, positioned in the favor of the UFC against what I would say without being disrespectful common sense, right? Would be when he was positioning against Francis Ngannou fighting Tyson Fury. And he said that, you know, he basically framed the Conor McGregor and Floyd Mayweather fight. At, at like, uh So I'll stop this here real quick. And uh, just to, again, give a little bit of context, uh, Francis Ngannou is the heavyweight uh, champion of the UFC. Tyson Fury is a uh, heavyweight champion in boxing. I don't know. They have a million different things. And um, that's what Francis uh, wants to do. Now, Francis has a very unique story and a very inspiring story in the fact that he was literally a literal ditch digger in Cameroon when he found out that uh, boxing was a thing. He made his way over to Europe, uh, started training, found his way, uh, found MMA, found his way into the UFC, became the world champion, and um, is still on that path from the, uh, to to fulfill his dream that he had, literally digging ditches in Cameroon to become a a, a professional boxer. So. Um, that was, uh, uh, something that included a lot of contract talks and because he is the heavyweight champion of the world, he's very valuable to the UFC and the UFC doesn't really, doesn't do co-promotion, co-promoting except for the, the one, uh, Conor McGregor and Mayweather fight. But, uh, the, the idea in both the, that case, uh, and the one that he's, he's talking about with this Nate Diaz guy is that they're near the end of their contracts with the UFC. And they are also valuable ent entities to the UFC. So the UFC wants to keep that to themselves. And they don't want, uh, you know, to have a Nate Diaz or a Francis Ngannou, who is a valuable person in the combat sports world, going out and fighting with boxing, doing a Jake Paul fight, doing something with a, a rival organization, uh, anything like that. So that, that's kind of uh, what he's talking about here. 
uh, an event that had failed, you know, that they had taken a bath. If I'm not mistaken, I'm pretty sure that he said that there were people involved in that that took a bath specifically. And I'm like, they sold 4.2 million pay-per-views. It's the second biggest pay-per-view in combat sports history behind Manny Pacquiao and Mayweather. The idea that that was an unsuccessful, you know, endeavor is ludicrous, right? I respect the ability to propagandize anything, uh, but there is no way that you can defend McGregor and Mayweather being a failure of any kind. There's no way you can defend it being anything other than an absolutely wild success. And also, Chell knows this business, man. Like, there's, matter of fact, I might even say there's no one except for maybe Dana that knows the business better than Chell. And so if there's something that I know, then he knows it as well, which is everyone knows that the Tyson Fury and Francis Ngannou fight's going to sell. And if you tell me that you think that it won't, then you don't understand the fucking fight business, okay? And people, every time I talk about this, people go in the comments and they're like, look, here's Pierre Francis's last, last round of pay-per-views. Look, look at how, look at, he only sold this many pay-per-views. He's not a draw. It's like, oh, well, that's an interesting, that's an interesting point. Uh, is there anyone else fighting in that fight? Like, is he fighting against himself or... Does each store or each fight have its own story? You know, like, so does it maybe matter who he's fighting or like Francis versus everyone, anyone is going to be exactly the same. Because what we're proposing is him fighting against Tyson Fury in a boxing match and in MMA gloves. My fucking idea. Okay. So like, if you're telling me that the first time Tyson Fury boxes absent boxing gloves, that's not going to sell. Fuck you. Okay. I'm not saying Chael, fuck you. But if you person, because Chael knows it'll sell. He's just saying that. Okay. You person, if you actually believe that that fight won't sell, fuck you. Because you're wrong. Okay. Plain and simple. And so if, Chael is saying it won't sell. He's doing it because he's working, you know, he's like trying to shape public opinion or potentially shape the opinion of people who might be making decisions related to this thing, right? So I only, I bring up that particular fight. It's going to come into play later. But just as an example of like- I know we're going for a while. Ride with me. Trust me. Trust me. You're going to want to have this context when we go into the interview. A blaring example of like, okay, so I'm listening to him. This is, you know, this is why he's saying it. And the reason why I bring that up is because he made a video that went up, like I think yesterday that I watched today that was about Nate Diaz and Jake Paul which, in my opinion, tips the hand of what the UFC is going to do here strategically, okay? Or what they have to do, essentially. So again, he's going in to talk now about a video that this guy, Chael, who also makes videos, the, the retired fighter, he's making a video about this guy, Nate, who is at the end of his contract with the UFC. The valuable entity is nearing his end of the contract. And the UFC wants to keep him around, but he doesn't want to stay in the UFC. So the UFC has uh, every incentive in the world to try to uh, uh, either lower the stock of this fighter or to keep him around so that they can be the beneficiary of his uh, his his stardom. So the example I just gave, right? He was rallying against a Francis and Tyson Fury fight. Now, assume that he's you know speaking on behalf of the UFC. Now, since then, it's possible that the UFC is now you know, positioning to co-promote a Tyson Fury and Francis on a fight and the landscape has changed completely. But at the time, that was not the case, which is why, you know, they were positioned that way. But the bottom line is, you know, if, you know, if you're looking at this Nate Diaz situation, the UFC wants Nate Diaz to resign. They want, the, they need the Conor McGregor fight. They need like a Moscow fight. Nate Diaz is a huge asset. The UFC's business lives on big blockbuster fights. Okay. And if you have these big blockbuster fights that you know are right there, you can't lose them. I mean, that, like your priority one is you cannot lose those fights. You can't have a Nate Diaz, Conor McGregor three fight sitting right there and you let it slip through your fingers. You can't, like that can't happen, you know? And so they that, need that might be why if you are not a fan of the sport and you do recognize the name Nate Diaz, that is because he's the guy who fought Conor McGregor twice, beat him the first time. And that is why why he is so valuable he need to resign Nate Diaz if at all possible however Nate Diaz does not need to resign if he doesn't want to and he's made very clear that he wants to fight his contract out now why does he want to fight his contract out because he wants to go fight Jake Paul and get paid an enormous amount of money okay so the UFC doesn't want that to happen they want him to resign here so if, he, if Nate is saying let me out of my contract what you can assume there is that he's gone through the process of you know of them bringing him different options to get him to resign which he's saying no to and if he's you know he's just sitting there like just give me a fight I want to fight my contract out the UFC's like uh, yeah no but you can assume that he has an end date on his contract since Francis did. I don't know anything about Nate Diaz's contract, but if assuming that he has an end date on his contract, which I'm sure he does, then UFC doesn't have endless time to just stall on this. They're going to have to either give him a fight or he's just going to run out of time. He's going to be a free agent anyway. Okay. So if Nate has stuck his feet in the ground, he's like, no, I'm not going to resign. Well, then what choice does the UFC have? Right. Okay. So this is my point. So Chael, when he did this video about Nate Diaz and Jake, all of a sudden he is actually trying to talk Jake Paul out of a Tommy Fury fight and talking into an Nate Diaz fight. Now the way he positioned it was that, you know, Jake Paul cannot afford another, another bad outcome, right? Like, you know, bad outcome being his last time. Willie fight didn't sell very well. Okay. So he's like, you can't have two flops in a row, right? The, the numbers have been, you know, going down, right? They're not going up, they're going down. Now I think in order to get there, you're taking into account that the Tyson, Mike Tyson fight did enormous numbers. So I'm not really sure exactly. I didn't look at exactly, but bottom line, he is right. Okay. If you only sold hundred thousand pay-per-views with the Tyron, Tyron Willie fight, you can't, you can't flop again. You need a big fight. You need to sell. He's right about that hundred percent. And so again, we're talking about uh, Jake Paul, who I'm sure people know have, uh, has taken over the boxing world and made this celebrity boxing thing uh, where he's boxing uh, uh, MMA fighters. That's, that's what uh, this guy, Nate Diaz, who is now a UFC fighter, the guy who fought Conor McGregor. That's what he wants to go do because the money in boxing is way, which is also, you know, Francis 
the, the heavyweight champion. Francis wanted to go over mainly because it was his dream, but also because the money in boxing is like 10, 100 times more than you can make in uh, uh, in uh, the UFC. And the UFC is the, well, uh, yeah, it's 10 times more, 10 to 100 times more than you can make in the UFC. They, they're trying to trap you in this Tommy Fury fight. It's not going to sell. You need a big fight. You need Nate Diaz. And, you know, without getting into the rest of it, that was the gist. He's like, you need Nate Diaz. And I'm sitting there going, okay, so Chael is, is advocating for Nate Diaz to fight Jake Paul when we know the reason that Nate doesn't want to re-sign with the UFC is because he wants to fight Jake Paul. So this is this is not, you know, like, there, there has to be something else going on. If Chael is advocating for this and he's always advocating in the direction of the UFC, then something has changed, right? And so my hypothesis is that the UFC is now put in a position where they have to co-promote something for Nate Diaz with Jake Paul, or at least that's how they're going to position it. Like, you, you don't need to go free agent. You know, you don't need a free agent. We'll help you facilitate the fight with Jake Paul. And then you're assigned with us afterwards. So you get both, you know, you get both. You get the Conor McGregor fight, you get this. And, you know, we're going to help you with the Jake Paul fight and we're going to make it even bigger. So it's either that or Chael is like, look, Nate Diaz is actually a close friend of mine. He said that in the video. He's like, he's one of the cl a close friend of mine. And so maybe he's like, I'm going to actually give him really good advice and not consider the UFC's needs. I think that's unlikely, not because he's disingenuous or anything. I mean, it's not bad advice to get to tell Nate to take a deal with the UFC that they co promote Jake Paul. As a matter of fact, that's the best thing he should do, right? Le take your leverage. You know, lock in this Jake Paul fight, assuming that Jake Paul will co-promote with the UFC, which I'm sure he will. You lock that fight in, and then you lock in the Conor McGregor fight, probably the Masvidal fight, and you know, you end up clearing fucking I don't know, 20, 25 to 40 million dollars over the you know, depending on how things shake out over your last three fights. Fight. I mean, that that is the correct play. And even if I'm off, like it's 50, you know, it's 10 million for you know, 10 million for Jake Paul, and it's five or six for the next two. That's still plenty of money to do whatever the fuck you want for the rest of your life. I know it's a long video. We're almost done. Stick with me, right? In addition to the money you've already made. But, you know, it's also possible, that, like I said, that Chael's prioritizing his, his relationship with like, He knows that Nate Diaz wants to go fight Jake Paul. He's like, you know what? I'm just going to give him this advice to just go fight Jake Paul. I'm going to, you know, work against the UFC's interests. That seems extraordinarily unlikely to me. So I think what we're looking at is a change in tactics from UFC. Now, what else does that probably mean, right? Like, if you think, okay, so is there anyone else that's in a very similar situation that we were just talking about? Okay. And again, here we have, uh, you know, so it just was just talking about two or three different seemingly unconnected uh, uh, things. Two or three seemingly unconnected things. And... Now he's, uh, you know, he's he's drawing through lines and he's connecting dots and he's showing how the 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 business works. That's really what it comes down to. Is this is you know when 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 people don't understand what's going on, this is the guy that's going to let you know what's going on. So let's continue. Oh shit! Oh Jesus! Francis is in the same situation, and so if the UFC is starting to entertain a uh, Nate Diaz co-promote with Jake Paul, you know, to do the Jake Paul fight and then back with the UFC, then you would assume the same model should be in play for Francis, right? You do the same thing with, with uh, Tyson Fury and then you have him locked in as the heavyweight champion of the UFC as opposed to the alternative, which is if they don't do something with the UFC, right? If Francis doesn't do anything with the UFC, I mean, I know what they're going to do. Like they're, they're going to fight Tyson Fury first. That's a locked in enormous payday, $20 million minimum, right? And then after that, let's say, let's say he got eviscerated by Tyson Fury, right? Let's say he got pieced up and just fucking dirt mapped, like made to look ridiculous, okay? So you can't sell another boxing match. Okay, we well, already made 20 there. Okay. Then they can go to all the other promotions and do one offs. One FC is like is is literally like like trying to get Francis to come over to one FC right now. You know, I don't know the financials of all these other companies. Obviously, the UFC is best positioned to, to pay Francis better than all of them anyway. So to me, to me, one FC is just another organization like the UFC. Uh, they also do MMA. UFC is just like you know, football is the sport, NFL is the organization, MMA is the sport, UFC is usually the organization, Bellator. Uh, professional fighters league, aka PFL, one FC, one fighting championship. All these are just other organizations. Uh, so it would be like Canadian Football League or whatever. So it's a no fucking brainer. You sign with the UFC and you have a, you know, you just you get the Tyson Fury fight first. So you get the locked in Tyson Fury fight, and then UFC has you locked in. Like everybody gets what they want. I mean, I know UFC obviously would rather not have Francis fight Tyson Fury, but maybe that's not the case, right? Maybe they maybe they don't care. You're just you're gonna have to give you know Francis that payday, which candidly he's gonna get anyway. And then you get locked in. I mean, it seems like it's an identical situation. Let me pose this to you guys, okay? Why not do it on the same card? And it's like the fucking biggest blockbuster in, I mean, can you fucking imagine how many pay-per-views that would sell? Like, can you fucking imagine how many pay-per-views that would sell? And you also could, there is another option too. There's another option. You could bring Nate, Nick Diaz in there also. You have Nate Diaz fight one of them. You have Nick Diaz fight the other. You got the Pauls against the Diaz's and then you have Francis fight against fucking Tyson Fury. And then you have someone else fight against Tommy Fury. Fucking dude, you do Mike Perry against fucking Tommy Fury in the undercard? I mean. Come on, come on. And like he is coming, it's uh, from what it seems like he's coming up with this stuff off the top of his head. These, these, you know, oh, you should do this. You should do this. You should do this. And uh, it, it just demonstrates an understanding of the business that people like myself appreciate, but don't 
really understand to that level. He's just got it on on just another level. And and so it's this kind of stuff, how he knows this stuff and how he applies it to not just MMA, but to life, to business, to family. You know, he's a uh, a husband, he's a father, he's a he he works he's uh, started businesses. He's done so don't uh, uh, you know think that the MMA analysis is his uh, 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 claim to fame here. He is amazing at that, but this is just a little bit of context. We're almost done. Let's uh, uh, finish this up, and uh, then we will get into the interview. Come on. I mean, that's too many. And honestly, it's too many people to pay, right? Like, it's too many. Like, you don't put six blockbuster people on there because, you know, oh, t- you know, Tyson Fury wants his $30 million. You know, Francis wants his $25 Nate wants his 15. Jake wants his 15. I mean, you probably actually fucking could afford all these because that shit is going to sell, son. That's just going to sell. But you, so you have Tommy Fury against whoever, Tyson Fury against Francis. You have Nate Diaz against Jake Paul. You have Nick Diaz against Logan Paul. I mean, let's fucking go, son. Let's go. Okay, one other thing. So, so I, I, I'm, I'm going to stop it there. I think there, there's something else in the video that's pretty awesome, but if you're not an MMA fan, you probably don't care. And that, I really, again, I just wanted to give some context to who Jesse is, what he does, what is his claim to fame, and why he is uh, going to be, why we're going to be talking to him. So he is somebody that uh, you you want to know. Um, I feel very lucky to know him. Uh, I think that, you know, I don't necessarily agree with everything he says, whether it's about MMA or if it's about politics, I don't necessarily agree with him, but he has an extremely unique perspective. He's very, very good at reading people and, um, he has a lot of life experience. I don't have to justify myself to you guys. If you ride with me, you ride with me. Jesse on fire is somebody that we want to hear from. If you're not part of that club, I will see you later, but. For the rest of you, if you're still here, this is going to be a great interview. So without further ado, let's bring in the man himself, Jesse on fire. (laughs) 